and uh, it's recording now. So I want to welcome welcome everybody to the February Omaha 365 uh, user group meeting. And um, normally I have some slides to talk about what we're going to be doing coming up this year, but I haven't prepared those. Uh, we do have a meeting book for March, and um, and I'll have that on the website. Um, hopefully next week, and um, that's going to be March 11th, which is not the first Thursday of the month. So be prepared for a change in date, but it'd be March 11th. Then we also have um, one scheduled for April already, and then one for May already. And so we're also looking to schedule out the rest of the year. So um, just uh, continue going to the website for updated information on meetings and and uh, I'll try to keep uh, that website up, as up to date as I can. Um, still could use some speakers for the rest of the year. And like I've always mentioned, um, we like to have local speakers talk about what they're doing with SharePoint, Office 365, Microsoft 365, I guess. Um, you know, it, how you're using Teams, those types of things. Uh, it's really good to hear from our local companies to, and to how they're actually using these tools. And so with that in mind, I think we're going to have Amber talk about uh, how Gavilon's uh, using or doing their upgrade. And then, um, and I'll probably talk about our upgrade that we're doing. So, um, that's coming up this year. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce David. Uh, he volunteered to speak for us this month, and I'm just going to let him introduce himself and talk a little bit about himself, and um, it's yours, David. All right. You. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for the uh, thanks for hosting today, and I appreciate it to be here. Um, so yeah, so we're going to be talking today about some records management in Office 365 or Microsoft 365. Um, a little bit about myself, um, as, as David said, my name is David Drever. Um, I am a senior manager and enterprise architect with Protivity. Uh, I'm also a five times um, Office Apps and Services MVP. Um, I actually, my, my specialty is actually in SharePoint. Um, uh, previously was in SharePoint. I actually started out as a SharePoint MVP. Um, but I have moved very heavy into the, the compliance area of, of Office 365. Um, you know, cloud security, power apps, power, and power automate those those kind of tools. So I do a lot of that. Um, but uh, a lot of what I do is, I think, uh, around records management. It's becoming um, a, a lot a larger topic these days. I find a lot of organizations are are realizing that they're either hanging on to information too long, or things are getting removed when they shouldn't be, and and they're losing data. So. Uh, records management is becoming a, a much bigger topic, I find, these days. Um, so if you ever have any questions from today or if you need to reach out for anything like that, uh, I have my email address there, david.driver at portivity.com. I'm happy to, to help out with anything you're, you're, uh, you need uh, information on, uh, help with that sort of thing. I, I tweet at David M. Driver and I blog at uh, prairiedeveloper.com. Um, I will be uploading my slides to prairiedeveloper.com this afternoon, so um, you can be able to grab those slides uh, for your use um, uh, to refer back to if you wish. So a couple of things we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the basics of, uh, of retention. Um, the, from there, we're going to move into, you know, talking about disposition um, and then, you know, talking about records in Microsoft 365. and and I have this separate from retention basics because it is more of a comp, not not advanced topic, uh, advanced ideas and things around it, how it's controlled, and, and just uh, just the big piece I want to call it out so that people are aware of it's you know the fact it's not quite the the same as just a regular retention capabilities. Um, then we're going to talk about applying your content in in uh, the different tools that you have and SharePoint or OneDrive that sort of thing. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about event-based retention, and this is more of an advanced topic. I do have a demo around that. Um, quick question there, David. Um, I know that the meeting goes till 1230. Are we okay if we go beyond that a little bit, or, or do we need to keep it to 1230? 
Sure, we can we can go past the twelve thirty, and if people have to leave, they can drop off and watch. Sure. The cool. So, so what I'll do, everyone, just to let you know, just um, I'm gonna um, focus. I have one significant demo at the end, um, event-based retention, that I want to show you all, um, and I'll I'll do that, and then I'll maybe kind of do some other de um, other demos for those who still have time um, about some of the more basic things. So I'm not too sure if anyone here has worked with records management, so I don't want to. Um, you know, for those that are here, the purpose of this was time to talk more about the advanced topics, um, but the basics are, are super important too. So I'll maybe take some time for whoever's able to stick around at the end to kind of go over some of the basic stuff as well. So I want to talk about the basics. So we got I want to kind of build up to what we're going to be kind of talking about focusing here. Um, so the thing about records management in the past is phys records management has been a physical uh, based on physical records, physical documents, and and what I find with that is that um, because it's been based on physical records, it doesn't always translate into um, electronic records very easily. And, and the reason for that is Microsoft 365 doesn't have the concept of moving content around based on um, the stage of um, retention the document is in. In older versions of SharePoint, and I guess you probably could still have it there, there was a concept of a record center. When content was archived, you would actually move it into the record center, that sort of thing, and be retained there. That is no longer a thing uh, in Microsoft 365. Um, the idea behind Microsoft 365 retention is in place. So when you create the document, when you uh, you know, assign a retention schedule to it while it's being retained and as it's being disposed of, all of that happens at its where it's sitting at. So you don't have to go looking for it at the different stages. You always know where it is because it hasn't been moved. Um, along with that is disposition control. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to, as soon as the content is is up for disposition or up for be de deletion. It doesn't have to be deleted automatically. You can actually have some control over that. You can review the document. You can make sure your SMEs agree that this is no longer um, uh, uh, useful anymore uh, and can be disposed. So you have that level of control now that you, you don't necessarily have, um, you didn't have in, in older versions um, or even other tools. Something to think about with my records management as well is that it goes beyond a little bit uh, beyond the the actual content uh, or concept of just retaining your data. Um, you know, records retention also allows you to classify your content, and you can actually have different rules around that. Um, so you know, if if uh, your content is is a particular sensitivity, then that affects the retention. Um, you know, if it's if it is a certain, you know, uh, you know, being able to, you know, all of your content, you know, make sure it's it's for all of HR content. You want to have all that organized. You can actually do all that with your retention as well because you have things like content explorers in your in your environment that will actually show you where all of your content is based on the retention label that's been applied to it. So it's also another way of classifying your content. Now, in Microsoft 365, balance has been a key thing that Microsoft has been trying to deal with um, because records management as a rule can, especially with electronics, can be very invasive. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, you know, usually you have to go and you have to set all the content, you have to set your 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 labels, you have to set, you know, maybe even some defining information to help set those labels. So, you know, users may not want to do that. Um, they may not have time, they may think that they don't have, they don't have time to do all that. So Microsoft's trying to balance that by providing ways to automate the process, to automatically apply um, retention, to automatically um, you know, dispose of content. Um, when it comes to that, that's something they are trying to find a good balance that gives the records manager, record managers the ability to have the control they want, but still allow users to, to utilize it properly, um, have a good user experience. I've been in environments where there was too much control and too much requirements put on the content and, and users simply just didn't use it. They would store their content in other places because it was too much of a, uh, a task for them to do it. 
to, to do it in the in the record center. So uh, it wasn't being used properly. And, and, and this is the balance that Microsoft is trying to achieve. So before I move on, is there any questions about some of the general concepts in records management in Microsoft 365? So let's talk about how re records management is done. Hey, David. Oh, yes. I just want to say, tell everybody that you can unmute your microphones and respond or ask questions too. So perfect. Yeah. And please, if you have a question at any point, uh, don't hesitate to interrupt because I, I do like answering. I feel it's a, a good point. If I'm not covering something that you need to know, I'd be happy to, to answer the questions. So 90% of your retention in Microsoft 365 is done with what's called a retention label. And when you get down to it, a retention label from a content perspective is just a piece of metadata. It's just a, 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 a field, a metadata field on your content. Um, but in the back end is where all the magic happens. So the retention label is, is not defined in the content type hub. It's not defined on the site. It's actually defined at the tenant level itself, at the at the um, uh, the retention management console inside your compliance admin console, and so the retention labels are created um, within the label themselves. You can actually you know configure your retention timelines. You can uh, your retention triggers. All of that's actually at the retention label itself. Um, it, it's a bit different than I don't know if anyone here is familiar with um, some of the other tools out there like Open Text. Um, open text, you know, you have a bunch of different places that all come together to, to affect your retention policies. You have your RSI, uh, your records, um, I can't remember what the, what the RSA stands for, that defines like how long your retention periods are. You have different areas as well that define what the, what the retention um, schedules are. Um, it's all in different places. You have to maintain that. In, in Microsoft 365, it's all in one place on that label. So, you know the label is created. You can, and then, and then um, you can apply the label manually. You can apply it automatically. Um, if you want any sort of automation to your retention label application, um, that is actually an E5 license. It's if you don't have E5 licenses, you aren't stopped. But if you're audited by Microsoft, you may be asked to true up your licensing because you're using um, features that aren't there. So I just want to put a little warning there. When it comes to records management in Microsoft 365, as soon as you say automate, you're probably dealing with an E5 license at that point. Now, one thing I want to make sure we don't get some confusion on here with retention labels is a sensitivity label. And um, I'm only mentioning this here now because they very similar names. So you think they're the same thing and, and they're not. Sensitivity deals with the, you know, labeling your content based on how sensitive it is. Is it internal to the company only? Is it highly um, restricted? Is it highly confidential? Does it have some you know, trade secrets in it? Things like that. So that's what sensitivity label is for. Sensitivity label doesn't control how long your data is maintained. It can control how long or who has access to the data, but it doesn't actually control how long it's maintained. So I just want to make sure that everyone's kind of a, a familiar with the difference between those two. I probably won't talk too much about sensitivity labels for the rest of the session, but that, that was just a key thing I wanted to make sure uh, everyone was aware of. Now, with your retention labels, you can create the label, um, but it, it doesn't do anything. And, and, and the reason for that is that when there's two parts to the retention labels uh, within Microsoft 365, there's also another, um, another piece that's called the retention label policy. And the reason there's this two parts, this two part component to to um, retention in Microsoft 365 is that in a lot of environments um, like open text and things like that, when you have retention, um, you have the re even in an older version of SharePoint as well, when you have retention, the retention controls or the schedules, they existed for all content. So if you're working in an environment that has thousands of retention labels, and I've worked with with companies that have had that many, um, you know, it, it, it gets unusable because, you know, you have to go and go through this huge list of retention um, schedules to ch choose the right one. 
this is where retention labels come into play. A retention label is there to push out, sorry, retention label policy, I apologize. Retention label policy is there to control how your retention labels are provided to the user. And what I mean by that is that, you know, I could have this, I have an HR, um, it's, it's called an employee resume document. So an employee resume document has a certain retention applied to it based on the label. Now, someone in operations doesn't need to deal with maintaining an HR resume or a, 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 an employee resume. That's for HR to worry about. So I only want to push out the employee resume label to the locations that are going to be storing that information. So that could be the HR SharePoint site. That could be an HR controlled team. Um, you know, those kind of things. And, that, and that's, you know, th that is the idea behind the retention label policy is it, it takes the retention labels and pushes them out to the locations they're used. So you don't have to have every single label in every single location. You can very much limit to where your labels are going to go. Now, I don't want this to be confused with a retention policy because Microsoft is notorious for, you know, naming things the same so that they, they all sound the same. Um, retention policy is sort of the, I call it the big blunt hammer approach. It's, it's also known as a default or a blanket retention. And the idea behind it is that it'll apply retention to locations um, in a broad strokes. Uh, so for an entire site may have retention uh, applied to it, um, you know, uh, at the entire site level. And the reason I call this a big blunt hammer or a, or a blanket approach is the idea is it's kind of used as a stopgap or, or a catch-all. So if, a if users aren't labeling the content for retention or you have auto apply rules that aren't catching everything the retention policy provides you a fallback because it'll apply retention to all your content if you choose to you can apply in a site or in a location and usually the rule of thumb is you know if hr has documents and the longest retention policy they have is 10 years maybe you apply a default retention policy of 10 years and everything gets caught in that 10 year period now, the problem with this is that retention policies do not have disposition controls. So when the retention policy is reached, it will either delete the content or it will leave the content alone. And it only, its only purpose there is to make sure it isn't deleted for those 10 years. So what that means is, is that you could actually lose content before uh, it's actually um, it should be removed. So if you have content in your site that has the 10 year retention policy applied to it because that's your blanket policy, but it really is something that wasn't labeled but should have been labeled for permanent retention, um, it, there is a chance it could be removed. So usually what I see in most organizations is that they'll apply you know, a five year retention policy, a 10 year retention policy, just to stop people from deleting the content before it should be deleted. I want to mention a possible fallback or a possible issue with this. Small organizations that store a lot of data in Microsoft 365 may not have the licensing required to maintain all of that data without having to pay extra for it. Um, retention policies, if a content is, is being maintained by a retention policy, that's also counted against your overall Microsoft 365 storage. So the longer you retain content, the longer it can build up and count against your overall storage. So it's something that you really need to find a balance on. If you have content that you know, is, needs to be kept around for a while and it starts building up the overall storage, you need to be sure that you are uh, being cognizant of that, of that fact when you're building out your policies. So I've talked about some, some key things here. Does anyone have any questions about what I've talked about so far? All right. So let's talk a little bit more about some label policies and how they act in the different tools or the different locations. So in SharePoint, you know, policies and labels, they can be applied at the site collection level. Um, if you happen to have an, uh, your environment actually happens to have sub sites in it, 
you can't push labels um, or policies to a subset. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Was there a question? And is it mistletoe? Um, so you you can't you can't push a a um, uh, a label policy or a label to a a subsite. It, it it's kind of it, it's kind of a a, um, a bit of a, a problem I see in the in the back end in that it, it makes it seem like you can and it fails. Um, and the idea behind that is is that they they need they happen to hit the container at the top level in order to get it pushed out to the, the all the locations within. What that means though is that you know if you happen to are if you are using subsites in your environment and you happen to push the label out to the parent site, um, that label will also be available to all the sites underneath as well. Whether they should be or not, they are available. So it's something to be aware of that you have to do it at the site collection level. But when you are pushing out the, the label policies, you can select the locations that it is. It doesn't have to go to all the locations. You can push it out to five or six locations and you won't have any issues around that. But something to be, to be aware of though, is that if you aren't pushing the label out to all locations, you need to revisit the policy as new sites come online. So if you know if a new HR related site comes online that needs to be it needs to have that um, HR label, the employee resume label applied to it, you have to go back to the policy and update the policy to make sure that it's actually pushing it out to the new sites as well. So that is a manual process. Um, I think it can be scripted. Um, but um, there is a you have to be cognizant of the fact that as new site collections come online, if you have label policies that are a targeted label policy, um, as these new sites come online, you will have to actually uh, update those policies to make sure the sites are picked up. Uh, same thing. Um, so OneDrive, because it's a SharePoint site in the back end, um, you know, is is the same. Now the difference between OneDrive. Um, and SharePoint is that OneDrive doesn't allow you to actually set a retention label, so you have to use retention default retention policies there. Um, I need to update my content here. I do apologize, everyone. Um, you can you can apply sensitive or content based on sensitive content, um, but again, you you can't apply the labels directly in in uh, OneDrive because you you have no control over the metadata in OneDrive today. Um, hopefully, that's coming at some point, but right now it's not there. Change uh, a little bit different. Um, sensitivity labels. I just want to make mention here. Sensitivity labels um, can be applied to the mailboxes. Um, labels when you're dealing with auto applying of labels can only be done in flight. So as messages come in or as messages go out, um, there is no ability right now to uh, apply retention labels to content at rest unless you're applying it to the entire mailbox or the, uh, a folder in the mailbox. Um, when you're pushing retention labels out to users for them to use in their in their mailboxes, it can take up to seven days for it to be available. Um, that's what Microsoft says. I find it much quicker than that. It's um, I think it's actually maybe a day now. It's, it's much much quicker. Dave, I did yeah. have a I did have a question on something you mentioned earlier. Sure. That you said that retention policies do not have disposition controls. Are there other disposition controls available within M365? Yes. So okay. with the retention label itself, so if you're if you're applying retention based on the label and not on a policy, so the label itself um, does have the ability to apply a retention control. And you know what, maybe what I'll do really quick here is let's take a look at that. Um, just so I can kind of, it's easier to see it as if we talk about it. So uh, let me just show my right screen here. Okay, so I'm in my records management environment here and I'm gonna create a new label. So, the, and, and this label here, um, come on. So we'll just call it, you know, Omaha, uh, 365 demo. Um, let's see here. This label was created for. Okay. Um, file plan descriptors, 
this is a way of organizing your labels in the back end. Um, it has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on the retention or the scheduling around it. This is simply to organize your, your uh, labels in your file plan. So if you have to go review them or update them or take a look at them, you can do that. Um, you know, you have some options here. You can say this is for information technology. Um, and this is dealing with compliance. Um, is this for a business rule, a legal rule, regulatory, regulatory rule? You know, notice I can add new categories here as well if I wish. Um, you know, reference ID, um, I could call it, um, we'll just call it um, OD365. Uh, and click next. So here I have, I can select the retention on the content. So I can set it to whatever I want. I can set it to seven years. Um, we'll set it to five days. Um, I can apply it when, from when the item was created, from when the item was last modified, um, when the item itself was labeled. I can also base it on an event. So when an employee is no longer with the company, uh, fiscal year ends, things like that are all types of events. So we'll do it based on when the item is labeled. Um, I can here retain items um, even if users delete. So what happens there? is that in SharePoint, you'll be blocked from deleting the content in OneDrive and Exchange. It goes into a backup folder, um, recoverable items folder in Exchange, and um, in uh, SharePoint, it's called, or sorry, OneDrive, it's called, um, uh, I'll, I'll get that name, I can't remember what it was off the top of my head. Um, now here's the disposition review. So I can actually set it to, to trigger a uh, disposition review when the label, when the, when the schedule is complete. So if I click next here, now I can say, who are my disposition reviewers? So if I do that, I set, I set the disposition reviewer. You can do it as a user themselves. You can do it as a mail enabled group. I suggest mail enabled groups. And the reason being is that you can add and remove um, disposition reviewers from the group without having to affect the label. If you add each person individually, you now are having to go in every time a reviewer is not available or they leave the organization or new ones come on, you have to actually go in and update the policy every time. And then you have your, you have things here that are all finished and, and you can uh, just review the settings. So now I've created the label. And it's just submitting. So to answer your question, I believe Sarah, you asked the question. To answer your question, this is where disposition controls come into play. Is, is this label? Um, the policy will not have a disposition control. The labels do. So that's why we always, you know, suggest that you know labels. That's where you want to do um, uh, do all your the most of your records of retention control. Um, I'll get a little bit coming up here. We'll talk a little bit more about dispositions themselves. So let's get back here. Uh, does that? answer your question okay Sarah kind of give you the, the idea of how it works too yes it does so I'm assuming when you use the policy to push out that label the the disposition just still goes with the label as it's that's pushed right. out okay yeah. perfect that's thank right. you because yeah. the disposition itself is is on the label not on the policy gotcha thank you you're welcome okay uh, Microsoft 365 groups very very similar to SharePoint and Exchange because you have both a SharePoint and Exchange in a, in a group so the rules that apply to SharePoint apply to the content stored in a group and then the, the mailbox that's attached to a group also has the same rules applied to it so basically it's just a combination of both of them <coughs> now all of this retention labels it deals with you know the the life cycle of your content and the finalization of documents. And what finalization of documents means is what happens to the content when it's no longer needed. So, you know, labels can be used for declaring your records. Um, you know, they can be uh, labels can be used to determine is content kept forever? Is it removed? Is it maintained for a certain amount of time then removed? You know, that's what the labels are. Now, there's two types of labels. They're not a category in the system. They're a category that is, I call them a process, cat, process category. An explicit label is anything that is set manually. So if I apply a label myself, 
I click on the option to, to set the retention label, that's an explicit label. If I have a process, a script, a program, um, a, uh, a Power Automate flow, if that sets the retention label, that's an explicit label. However, if I have a label, so if, if I have a document inside of a folder that has a label applied to the folder, any content inside that folder will actually get the same label. I can set default labels at a library level. I can also apply labels based on rules, so on content or on other metadata. Any of those automatically apply rules are called implicit labels. And this is, becomes important when you're dealing with what's called the order of precedence. Now the order of precedence is there when you have an automation of labels or retention that you know you have one or sorry two or more retention schedules, retention labels can be applied to the same content um, at the same time. So what happens is in order to determine which label is going to be applied to that content, there's called the order of precedence. So when you think about retention labels, you have an option of retaining the data um, and then doing whatever you want at the end of the schedule. You also have um, what's called a deletion label. And what the deletion uh, label does is it, it's just there to make sure content is deleted. It doesn't retain it. If you delete it before the schedule is on, it's not going to, it reaches, it doesn't, it doesn't stop you. Um, but what it does do, a deletion label is there to make sure content is deleted after a certain amount of time. Regulatory information maybe has rules around that, that after three years, no matter what, this content has to be removed. So that's called a deletion label. Um, in order of precedence, if you have two labels, one's a retention label, one's a deletion label that can both be applied to content, the retention always wins. If you have two labels, one with a three-year retention and one with a five-year retention, the longer retention period is going to win. Um, if you have a content that could be applied automatically by a label, but someone has already set the label, the explicit will always win. So an, a, an automatic retention or an implicit label cannot override a manually set label. If you have content that is only deletion, or sorry, if you have labels that are only deletion labels, one's a three-year deletion label, and you know, make sure this content is deleted after three years, one's a five-year deletion label, the three-year deletion label will be applied. Any questions about that order of precedence? Okay. Let's talk about disposition reviews now. So disposition reviews, they're there to actually remove information from the tenant. You have the option during a, a records manager or a disposition manager has the option of saying, yes, this content is ready for disposition, I said, no, it's almost ready. We need to extend it for another year or maybe you know a month just to make sure that the other content that's replacing it is in place. Um, you can even relabel the content that maybe it was mislabeled or label rules have changed and this is no longer valid. So you can actually, as a records manager, you can actually change the label as well during the disposition review. Um, as I just finished showing you, disposition reviews are defined at the label themselves. Um, you can add people in individually. Like I said before, I strongly recommend you use a mail-enabled security group. Um, and there are special permissions that um, even a global admin cannot see um, disposition reviews. You have to have, and usually what I suggest you do is you, you add a... Um, you add a new um, role in uh, in Microsoft 365 uh, and in the admin roles. Uh, I usually call it like disposition reviewers. And in that role, the user uh, the users within have to have what's called a disposition management role attached to it, and the view only audit logs management. And the reason for this is that those are the two roles that are required in order to both view the content. Um, sorry, I'll view the content, view the disposition labels, and view the uh, the view only or sorry, view any logs that have happened as part of that. 
um, without that custom role being created in the organization, no one's going to be able to actually see any disposition reviews. Um, just to, to kind of show you this here, um, if I go back to my records management console, um, before I created that view and added myself to it, as a global admin, um, of course this is super slow because there's people watching, um, I didn't even see a disposition tab. That wasn't even there. Um, I had to create this role that had, again, the disposition management and the view only audit logs. That had to be there in order for me to be able to see this tab to see the dispositions that are occurring. Um, dispositions, you know, you, you become in an email. That email doesn't actually show you. Um, sorry, yes? What were, so you said you would create a new role. Yep. And it had to have what in it again in order to make this happen? So it has to, I'll show you here. So we go into, into the permissions here. Sorry, we have to go into the here, go into the old view. So in here, um, I believe I did it here. So I have a disposition reviewer's role. And we can see in here that it has disposition management and view audit logs assigned roles to it. And in the members of it is I just added this conference demo group. I have a group called, called conference demo that I use for my, my presentations. So um, thank you. Yeah. So the other thing too, and I, I kind of showed you the different options you have when you are, um, as a records manager, you have the option again to you know dispose of my of the off of the content, extend the retention, um, or relabel it depending on your usage. But what happens when you have approved the disposition? Um, disposition will only happen after it's been reviewed and approved. If you don't if you don't approve a disposition of a document for like five years, it will not be removed those five years. Because it's based on a disposition review, nothing can happen to it until the disposition review is completed. Then it gets removed into the, um, the site collection recycle bin, not the user recycle bin, but the site collection, so the secondary recycle bin. It's left there for 93 days um, unless the um, the recycle bin is is less is pushed out because of the amount of data going into your recycle bin. Uh, secondary recycle bins are based on uh, day and size. So as more content goes into the secondary recycle bin, older stuff gets pushed out. So um, information that has been disposed of uh, goes into the, recy the secondary recycle bin and it's there for 93 days or less if it gets pushed out by new content going in there. Um, emails marked for disposition are, are maintained uh, for 14 days before they're completely deleted. Everything that you do in the uh, Microsoft 365 um, retention uh, uh, console is, lo is logged and audited. So approvals, um, relabeling, all of that is audited and tracked in the system and maintained um, for uh, records of dis dis destruction. Lots of organizations require a record of destruction. Um, and then Microsoft provides that through the logs. Um, one of the things that people have been asking for for a long time is multi-stage disposition reviews. Um, right now, if you do a disposition review um, and you're not the content owner, you have to export the list and send it to the content owner and say, can we delete this? What's coming, they just announced it a couple weeks ago, What's coming in June is multi-stage disposition. So what that means is, is that now, as part of a workflow or part of a process flow, um, you can actually have the content automatically that is flagged. If it has a content owner, you can actually send it to the content owner automatically, have them approve it, and then the disposition review continues. I don't know yet how this is going to look. They haven't shown me yet how this looks. But that is is what they are bringing, and that is something that is huge um, for Microsoft 365 disposition because 
it takes away a lot of the manual process that that has slowed things down. If you have an e-discovery, um, you know, hold or a litigation hold mm -hmm. implemented within M365, that yeah. will trump um, disposition. So does it not even present that data for disposition um, or does it still present it? And if you try to dispose of it, it would just not allow that disposition. So it's a, that's a great question. So e-discovery, um, if there's a legal hold on content, it's the disposition control cannot be triggered. So it doesn't even show up in your console. Okay. Once the legal hold is removed, the next time the job is run to check for disposed of content or the content to be disposed, it'll be picked up and it'll show up in the console. Great. Great question, thank you. So within Microsoft 365, you have your retention labels and you can, you know, you have can you have protections in place, you know, you can't you can't um, you know delete content if it has a retention label ap applied to it. Um, Unless it unless the uh, unless it's not a retention label, it's a deletion label. But then there's the concept of a record in Microsoft 365, which is different than a standard retention label. When you apply a record to a label, and that's just an just an attribute of the label itself, it's it's a, just a checkbox. When you apply that label, and it's been a declared a record label, I'll, I'll call them record labels now, a record label is a retention label that has the records option applied to it. If the content is a record label and uh, it's been declared as such and the label itself has been set on the content as a record label, it cannot be permanently deleted while the, until the schedule is completed. So even if it's in your OneDrive, even if it's in your Exchange mailbox, it cannot be permanently deleted. It'll, it'll be moved over to, um, in OneDrive, it'll be moved into the preservation hold library, it's called. And in Exchange, it's called the recoverable items folder. And it's, be, it's maintained there until the retention schedule has been completed. Um, it cannot be modified. The document can't be changed, it can't be edited. Um, it can't be removed, so it can't be moved to a different location. Uh, or it can be copied, but it can't be removed. The label itself can only be removed or changed by site collection administrator. So it really locks things down. Um, if the document is moved outside, um, and, and I said before, it, it can't be moved, it can be moved, um, but it can't be removed from the, uh, it'll still be stored in the location it was there because it can't be deleted from that location to create a copy in the new one. Uh, the record will be maintained in that new location as well. Now, what has been, it's relatively new. Because of that site collection administrator requirement to remove a label, it really made the user experience horrible because users, you know, once the content had been applied as a record, they couldn't, and they need to edit it, they couldn't because you know users us usually aren't a site collection admin. So what Microsoft has brought in is what's called record versioning. And what record versioning is, is simply a new item on the content itself that allows you to lock and unlock the document. Now, this is where it gets a little bit complex because every time you relock the document, it declares that version of the document a record. Anything that happens to the document in between being locked, or unlocked to being locked again, those versions are not records. It doesn't declare them as records. But let's say, for instance, you applied the label to version one of the document. At version one is now um, a record. You know, six months down the road, let's say a year down the road, you unlock the document, made some updates to it, and at version five, you relocked it again. So now what you have is you have two versions of that document that are records and are being maintained based on the retention rules. So remember, version one was 
was locked or was declared as a record in uh, one year ago. Let's say it was done in 2019. And if it has a five-year retention period on it, it will be re maintained until 2024. <coughs> Version 5 was updated in 2020. It will be maintained until 2025. So even though version one is still the same document, that particular version is only maintained until 2024 because it was declared a record in 2019. 2020 is a new record. So it will be maintained until 2025. Any questions about that? Anyone who has edit so, ability question, to, so, oh, so, yes, sorry. Is there, so is there no way to consolidate then or to undeclare version one as a, a record in favor of version five? No, because the label is there. It's it's saying that I'm, I'm declaring this version at this point in time as a as a record. So for instance, um, where this comes in, comes to be important is with policy documents. So if someone breaks a corporate rule based on uh, up the policy, but the policy is updated by the time that litigation occurs, they need to make sure that that version of the policy exists because that's what the litigation is against. So if a document is declared as a record, they don't want that version to be removed. So when you're declaring a document as a record, you're saying, this document is going to be a record. It has to be a record. It cannot be changed. Um, and and, and um, there is no ability that I'm aware of of consolidating them into saying, OK, we don't want number one to be a record anymore. Um, now, what that means, though, is that users aren't only going to save version one. It's the same rules apply to a SharePoint site that for, for regular publishing. So. If they don't have access to see previous versions, they're not going to see version one. Um, it's just going to be maintained in the back end for administrators to be able to make use of. But, you know, long story short, I do apologize. I kind of got a little long winded there. There's no way that I'm aware of that to consolidate and say that a previous version of a record is no longer required. What if you change the retention label on that version one? Can can a, can a, the same file have differing labels? No. So retention labels are not versioned. So if I make a change to the retention label, and one thing to note when you're making a change to retention label, all you can change, I think, is the description and the retention timeline. You can't change, you can't remove it from being a record. So if, it, if you declared the label as a record, you actually would have to create a new label that's not a record remove the label from the document and then apply the new record or the new label to it. So changing the label itself, the only options available to you are the retention period and the description once it's been created. Thank you. Yep. So um, when you're assigning um, or creating retention labels, you can also have the ability with it with an E5 license to auto assign the label. And that can be done based on sensitive content. So if you if you have special rules that some of your sensitive content based on credit card numbers, employee uh, information, things like that um, has to be maintained for a certain amount of time, you can actually auto apply labels based on that content. We can also base it on metadata or even content words within the, within the uh, document itself. All of that can be used to auto apply your label. Um, it uses what's called key, keyword query language or KQL. It's it's pretty, um, pretty standard to other languages if you're familiar with it. It's pretty much a natural language. It uses some keywords within it like and or not or near. Um, there's more than that. Um, one thing to think about here is that, you know, some examples here. So I have two examples showing on the screen here. The first one is it's going to apply the label if the content type of the label or the, of the document is accounts payable and within the document it finds protivity. 
So it's going to apply a label based on that content. Um, let's say, for instance, you are a you know working for, you know a city and you have special um, you know retention policies on your train maintenance um, documents. Now, some documents can get very long, so they could have train in it, and it could be even mean like it may not even be mean uh, a, a, a motorized train. It could be training people. Um, but it could also have maintenance in it as well. And, you know, for in the document, it's 100 pages long. That could show up, and you don't want a document that's that's about training or not even about maintenance on on a train to have this label applied to it. So what you do then is you use this train, and with this near n equals seven, what that means is if I see train within seven words of maintenance, it's likely a train maintenance document. So I'm going to say this is a train. I'm going to label this accordingly. If train happens on page one and maintenance happens on page 12, it's not going to apply the label because they're too far apart. So that near keyword is actually for is the content within so many words of, of the other word. So event based retention. This is the, um, honestly, this is a, one of the most common uh, uses of retention. A lot of, uh, you have the option of, like I said, when content is created, when it was last edited, when the label is applied, and event-based retention. Not very often do I see it when it's based on when it was created. Most often I see when it was last edited. But probably the most common is event-based retention. Usually it's based on, you know, when is an employee, uh, when employee left the company, um, fiscal year ends. Um, if you have vendors or, or uh, you know, procurement teams, they maybe have contract ex contract ex contract expirations could be an event. So these are all um, things that occur in the organization. They, uh, you know, they and because of that, um, records are based on when that event fires. So let's say, for instance, you have <clears throat> a project and the project has any project file has a three year retention applied to it. But you don't want it to do based on you, like you, when you last create the document, when you last edit the document, that isn't the defining factor. The defining factor is when is the project closed? So that's where an event retention comes into play. So you fire off the event saying that the project XYZ um, is done and any documents that have that label applied to it are going to have their retention applied uh, at that point in time. Now something that's very important with event-based retention, and this, this is event-based retention has to be really planned out. And the reason being is that in order for event-based retention to work, it has to have some form of identifying information to to find the right documents to apply the right label to. And the reason being is that, let's say for instance, I'm dealing with project closure and I'm dealing with a project requirements document and it has a three year retention. Now the problem here is that if I don't have some sort of identifying information for that, for that event, if I fire off the event, I'm going to go and it's going to apply their three year retention to all of my project files that have that label applied to it, even if the even if the if the uh, projects are still live. So you have to have when you're dealing with an event based retention, you have to have some form of identifying information, you know, project ID, employee ID, um, um, you know, contract ID. These sort of things they all have to be some way of saying that this group of documents goes along with this project and I, as an event I'm firing off the um, the event the retention schedules for that project only so I'll just pause for a second and find out if I've like thoroughly confused everyone any any questions okay so there's three main parts to event-based retention. There's the event type. An event type is basically just a container that describes the event. 
and uh, sort of the, the content within the event. So going back to my project example, I could have um, three different labels that all pertain to documents or projects. You know, project design, project requirements, you know, project change orders. Those could all have different retention uh, requirements based on the organization, so they all have their own retention labels. But they're all a project event type. So I, when I first declare it, I'm going to declare my project event. So let's see here. Here, I have an event type created called project lifecycle. That's my event type. Within my event type, I have three light labels. I have project requirements, project designs, and project change requests. All of those labels are contained within the project lifecycle. They're all, they can be, they're seen on the environment as a different, as their own labels, but in the back end, virtually, they are part of this event type called project lifecycle. <coughs> and in my organization, I have a bunch of documents for different projects, all with these labels applied to them. So we see here project requirements. I have project one, two, three, project ABC, you know, project change requests. Again, you know, project one, two, three has some documents in there. Uh, project XYZ has some um, some stuff in there as well. You know, they're all um, contained in the same event type, but they have different labels applied to them. Now, an event occurs. Project one, two, three completes. And because of that, I need to begin the retention schedule of three years or five years, depending on the label, for that project lifecycle. So I kick off an event. The project manager kicks off the event for a project lifecycle. And what happens now is that because those three labels are part of that event type, it's actually going to go. I don't have to kick off three different events. I'm kicking off one event. And it's going to go and get all the documents for project one, two, three that have the label project requirements, project designs, or project change requests applied to it. And it's going to activate the um, retention schedule. Any questions about that? All right. Um, we're getting. We're at the bottom of the hour now. Um, I'm just about done. I have one demo I want to show you here, and this is all around automating it. Event-based retention can take up a lot of time. Large organizations, if you have event-based retention, say around employee documents, an employee leaves, a con leaves the organization um, and you, are, um, you have to fire off, make sure you have an event that fires off that retains their documents for five years after they've left the company, you know, if you have tens of thousands of employees, and hundreds of thousands of employees that you have to do this for, that could be a full-time daily job just to do that. Um, because corporately you could have people coming and going all the time, and you, you do. So you can actually automate this process. So let's say for instance, I'm working in an organization that has Workday. We use Workday for our, our employee management. Um, Workday, there's actually in Microsoft Flow or Power Automate, there is a Workday connector. And I could have a Flow kickoff when Workday flags a, a, uh, an employee as a, um, and flags the employee as a uh, being terminated or retired or whatever the case may be, they're no longer an employee. That trigger is going to start my workflow. And my workflow is going to go and create the event based on that employee ID because I can get all of that information from Workday. And so as an HR person, all I've done is my normal day to the day work, but it actually kicked off the retention schedule as part of my day to day work. Didn't have to involve the records manager, didn't take up someone else's time. I've actually done all of that automatically. So it's kind of what I just described here. So your, your employee retention policies are actually defined by the records manager. But after that, the records manager is done. Employee is hired, HR does their normal thing. Um, the thing that to make sure is they make sure they have employee ID applied to the content. You can do that with document sets automatically. You can do that with folders automatically. Content within can have the 
employee ID applied automatically. So it's, it's a you know it's, it's a simple step to do that. Um, employee leads the organization. Content is uh, the update is is made in Workday, whatever tool you're using, and it automatically triggers the the retention. And all of this was done doing everyone's normal day to day day to day, day activities. No extra steps by the record manager is required. So to give you an idea, I've actually I've kind of simulate this. So I don't have Workday um, in my environment. What I do have is Power Apps. So I have a Power App here, and I have a number of employees. And so I have this one employee, Cameron Baker. We have a bunch of documents here for Cameron Baker. We can see we have a number of uh, retention labels applied to his content. And he has an employee ID of 8531567. So what I need to do is I have a power app and you could do this as a power app. You could do this, like I said, with Workday connector. I just don't have the connector. <clears throat> so I'm going to say that um, uh, Cameron has left the company. So 8531567. So I say employee ID 8531567. And he's off board today. And I click off board, off board the employee. It's clear it hasn't done anything. So what's happening now? Let me see if I can find it here. I had it open. Is I've actually kicked off a flow, and we'll let this flow do its thing. I'm going to show you how it looks though. So this workflow is, you know, when a when a document is is created or modified, um, and the first thing it does, it just does a quick pause to make sure all the settings are set. Because um, what I've had in the past sometimes is that when you're updating a list from an external source, um, the uh, there might be multiple steps to it. So you want to make sure you pause to make sure everything's set. Then it checks to see, is this an employee document? And is the employee offboarded option, which is what that Power App did for me, set to true? Then I go and I check to see, is the employee offboard date not blank? And then it falls into the steps that I want to actually take care of. So I wanted to actually offboard the employee. So this is an HTTP call. And what that means to you is that this cannot be done with an, uh, an Office 365 license. HTTP calls, unfortunately, are considered a premium um, or non standard connector. So you would need to have either a per user or a per app license applied for the user that is assigned to this flow. Um, <clears throat> and all it does is it's calling um, uh, the uh, a compliance endpoint in a Microsoft 365. <clears throat> for US, you wouldn't have this. This is a Canadian endpoint because I have my tenants in Canada. But <clears throat> for yourself, it would just be ps.compliance.protection.outlook.com. <clears throat> And you're passing in this information. This information is actually documented in in uh, Microsoft Docs. Uh, and basically, what I'm saying is, what's the employee ID? What is the asset I'm looking for? So I pass in the employee ID and I pass in the dates. And what's going to happen after that? Is it's going to create the event? And then I just want to update the I update the list item to say that I've done, so it doesn't get kicked off again a second time. So if we go over to our actual environment now, I sh actually should go back to see if it completed. And it didn't fail, no, it's still running. So it might just take a minute. Now hopefully it doesn't time out on me. Just running that right now. Um, something's gone wrong because it's throwing uh, a number of retries. So something, something's gone wrong. I might have turned, uh, made a change. So, um, or they made it. Um, but what's going to happen here is that if I go to my retention management system here, I go to my, go into my events. Come on.
Okay, so it did actually, so for whatever, it might, might be expecting a return, so maybe there's something that didn't come back properly it was expecting. Whatever the case may be, it actually did complete this employee offboarding. You see here, I just did it now. Um, it's, um, the time is, my, I'm an hour behind you guys, so the time is actually 11.36. And what's happening now is that it actually kicked off the event for me. I didn't do this myself, um, and it's kicked it off for that particular employee. We'll see that the asset number that's kicked off for here in a second, once it brings it up, it's still um, pending, hasn't been pushed out yet. And then it's actually doing it for that employee ID. So without any record manager inter interaction, I've actually taken care of that as an HR employee. Um, so there's no actual inter interactions. Now what's happened is, is that over the course of, a, I think it takes about a week, um, it can take up for a week, the event scans the entire environment and finds all the documents with that particular label um, or those labels in this case. Um, and that particular ID and it begins the retention on them and they'll be retained for five years, whatever the retention label is on that content. Um, and, and again, this was all done uh, automatically. So just pause there. Any, any questions about any of that? Okay. Do you have a few more minutes here? Does anybody have any questions about anything else? Um, because I, I would just like to say that uh, that's all I really want to cover today, but I, I do have some time here if anybody has any other questions or would like to see something. All right. Well, David, thank you very much for hosting. Okay. Well, thank you very much again, David, for uh, speaking to us. Um, there was a question on the uh, recording, and I'm actually taking off uh, for the airport right after this meeting. And so when I return on Monday night, I will try to get that uploaded to the YouTube channel that we have and then post a link to it on our website. So if you go to uh, our website under events, and then there's a link off that that says recordings, you'll see all our uh, meeting recordings. Or if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, you'll get an update also. So with that, I, have, um, I do have like, one question, but we yeah. can finish the recording first. OK. That, that was all I have on the recording. Go ahead. I mean, stop recording this session. <laughs>